Hello, my name's Tom Sullivan. We're in Turner's Falls, Massachusetts, in a little community called The Patch, a piece of land that was cut off when the power canal was dug back in the 1800s. We're between the canal and the Connecticut River. The name of my business is Pollinators Welcome, and I'm hoping that it becomes everybody's business and that we need pollinators because we're having a pollination crisis. As you may have heard, that colony collapse disorder is affecting many honeybees. So I'm interested in native bees as well as alternatives to the honeybee, since the honeybee is having such problems. And I'm planting for them, and I'm designing with them, and teaching about how important they are and what we can do. So this landscape here is showing some of what we can do by mixing edibles in with pollinator friendly plants. This is a very important plant for honeybees and bumblebees especially and other bees as well. It's the anise hyssop. This stand here self-seeded itself after um, a couple of years of having been planted elsewhere in the yard. Great flavor for us to make teas out of but also a long blooming beautiful nectar filled resource for honeybees and bumblebees. Don't forget to allow milkweed into your plantings. It grows by underground stolons. It comes up, pops up out of the ground, but it's not really that hard to control. Very easy to pull out. And once you've uh, hit them uh, pretty strongly uh, in the summer, you won't have to worry about them for most of the year. Get a little sunny patch here with uh, various greens of chards and dandelions mostly. Let your brassicas go to seed. Mustards come to mind very quickly and your um, also your lettuces when they go to seed when they start flowering let them go to seed if you can. Save the seed and save the small pollinators as well. Now, this is an annual it's called a blue emotion salvia. It's not native but it is a very important plant and that uh, many different kinds of bees will come to it. The carter bee especially will come to this plant, as will honeybees and monarch butterflies. This is a canna lily. The canna lilies are fantastic. I love having them around, not only for their beauty and their rich, big, exotic, tropical-like leaf, but also in their flower, which is fiery red, as you can see, and attracts hummingbirds. It is the most fantastic thing to have around. I would, I would have this in every landscape that I design. Another plant is a bee balm that attracts hummingbirds as well. So those two together really are a great pair. That's actually a yellow jacket. And the yellow jackets, of course, are uh, great predators. The many, many grubs of uh, so many different kinds of insects. But they're actually getting their fuel for their flying from this fennel plant that is similar to coriander, uh, similar to dill, a numble that very small flowers but very uh, very good to have. This is one of the most important summer flowering plant for bumblebees. Uh, you would not believe how many bumblebees come to this plant. It's a bergamot, Monarda fistulosa. This is a volunteer that came here from another part of the yard but it was so dominant in bees that I just couldn't pick it. It's my prime space for growing vegetables, but I favor the pollinators, so I let it grow. I may dig it up and move it around. But wonderful plant. It's in the mint family, and you will enjoy it beyond, beyond almost anything. It's a beautiful puffy pink flower that blooms for six to eight weeks. Out here I planted um, before Siberian irises, which are visited by bumblebees. Uh, they're not native by any means, but they are very useful, as are echinacea, which are going by now. But the seeds are very uh, consumable by goldfinches. And then we have two different asters, the New England aster being the purple one, and the yellow aster being from the Midwest. And here it's a little more obvious that there's a strawberry ground cover and those are very important for pollinators in the spring. So this is a pussy willow. 
The pussy willows are very important for early spring pollen production, and it really can bump up bumblebee um, bumblebee numbers very quickly because of how much pollen it puts out. We have to start thinking in a different way than we have with honeybees, where we store it in boxes, and they brought in great amounts of honey and and um, pollen and wax. But native bees are different. Most of them live in the ground. Of course, a lot of people are afraid of ground-dwelling bees. Yellow jackets, for example, live in, in the ground. But yellow jackets don't pollinate. 70% of our, our bees live in the ground. 30% live in woody materials like elderberries, raspberries, teasel, and um, sumac, which are very pithy, or, and bamboo, which are fairly hollow. So they like to nest in hollow cavities or places where they can dig out easily. 30% of the bees are that way. This is the bumblebee house. The idea here is to have a place that's dry, out of the sun, and spacious enough for bumblebees to grow two to five hundred young through the season. It takes them a while to uh, accept the house. So I put them out this spring not expecting any activity and I don't see any activity this year. But I'm hoping that it will next year. What they like is an undisturbed space as well. So I'm going to try not to disturb this very much. I might in the in the winter see if the nesting material, which I put some very sweet hay in there, would work for them. There's a tube that comes out of this end that runs from here to the inside. It's three quarter inches in diameter. It's big enough for them to get in. There might be mice in there and I haven't uh, put a screw through that hose yet, but I will in the spring, next spring, uh, to exclude mice just tell you what this yard was like before I came. It was a very squared off yard. Three feet in from the fence, there was cinder blocks set on their side. There was a mowing edge. It was fairly sterile. There were some forsythias and there were a few spireas uh, and lilacs, but nothing really of any uh, ecological uh, significance. So I had a party on my 60th birthday. A bunch of friends helped me move those blocks out of the way and help me put cardboard down as sheet mulch to create this garden here. Now what you want to uh, keep in mind when you're designing a uh, habitat is that some bees are an eighth or a quarter of an inch long or big. That means they don't fly as far as bumblebees or honeybees who fly about a mile to get to their nectar and pollen sources. So you want to have blocks at least three to four feet to make it worth their while to fly up to 200 feet for some of those smaller bees. And so if my neighbor in the future de decides to plant um, a garden, an edible garden of uh, fruits, vegetables, or herbs, it will have this pollinating source. My main focus is for long-term pollination, especially in terms of having it local, closer to our food source, so my yard by yard campaign addresses that. The idea is that we have contiguous flyways, contiguous habitat, meaning habitat connecting every yard, urban and suburban, and in farm situations as well. But if you can imagine three feet in from each fence line, from each neighbor, we create quite a resource that would be connected. And not only would it be connected for bees, but butterflies as well, and many other insects. Birds would be attracted to it. There are some book resources attracting native bees and managing native pollinators from the Xerces Society. The other work that I do besides design and consultation is as I give talks. In terms of the number of people that have gotten the message from me. I've been on the radio. I've given these talks. So I'm assuming there's probably you know, two or three hundred people so far that have heard me.